Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Tarek, and I'm part of the international sales department at uh, Easy Search Medical. It is our great pleasure to welcome you to the first colorectum episode of our surgical webinar series. The topic for today will be the innovative technologies in colorectum surgery. The first thing I would like to do is to introduce the speaker and the moderator of today's event. We have Professor Tarek Youssef from Egypt, who will uh, moderate uh, the session today. And then we have Professor Andreas Shamir from Austria, Professor Murad Abid from Algeria, Professor Leon Maggiori from France, and uh, Professor Ben Amar from Tunisia. I would like to thank you all for taking your time, and I would also like in advance to thank you for your contribution in today's webinar. It's a great pleasure for us to have uh, such an international group of uh, excellent surgeons with us here. And uh, considering your expertise and also your excellent reputation in the colorectum field, only your contribution can make this event a successful one. It's a pleasure for us as Easy Search Medical to support the colorectum education and to also provide such a platform where the, where the top surgeons and physicians can come together and discuss the most recent and important uh, topics in the colorectum field. I would also like to thank everyone who will join us today. We are pleased to welcome those of you who have been with us in our other webinars like uh, the 10 episodes of our Veritic webinar series as well as those of you who are new here. And now I wish you all a very informative event, and I would give the words to our moderator, Professor Tarek Yusuf. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you, Tarek, for uh, this nice introduction. Uh, it's an honor for me to introduce and to be the moderator for uh, this very uh, nice gathering, uh, collecting people uh, and uh, uh, professors and consultants for colorectal surgery uh, from all over the world. Uh, so uh, it's an honor for me to be the moderator of this uh, session, and I hope it will be nice and give a very good scientific uh, impact. I'd like to thank Easy Surge uh, Medical uh, Company uh, for hosting this uh, uh, scientific uh, event. Uh, and uh, Easy Surge uh, Medical Company is the one of the fastly growing uh, company in the medical field uh, in uh, the many invasive surgery, especially uh, here in Egypt. And it's fastly growing and taking a very uh, good uh, repetition and very good uh, 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 share of the market uh, in comparison to uh, its uh, near uh, by start uh, by the time. I'd like to welcome my colleagues and uh, the professors from uh, all over the, to be here with me uh, to moderate the session and to be as speakers. Uh, so uh, we would like to start uh, the session, which is uh, uh, titled by uh, Innovative Technology in Colorectal Surgery. And we will start by uh, Professor uh, Andreas Shamia. Uh, he is the professor and head of uh, general and visceral surgery at the Kepler University in uh, hosp hospital in Austria. And the topic will be uh, about uh, uh, the topic will be uh, about the total mesorectal excision. Uh, uh, no, it's uh, the, uh, the title. It's not uh, written here. So, uh, Andrei Shamea, uh, please, Professor, what's the title of your uh, talk? I just hello to everybody. Thank you for yes. inviting me to this lecture. I'm talking about a completely new topic on regenerative medicine in colorectal surgery. Ah, okay. It's not written in the agenda, so uh, excuse me for this. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Can you see my slides? Yes, perfectly. Okay. So it's my pleasure to give you a new idea of how to improve the anastomosis. This is the most important topic you need um, well-established and high-technology staplers. We have these staplers, but we try to get one step further to um, make anastomosis in colorectal surgery even more safe and reduce the leakage rate. I have no conflict of uh, interest. These products are used since 2000, uh, at the end of 2018, beginning 2019, routinely in our clinic. So this is nothing um, special just because of the lecture today. The safe 
the goal, the goal in colorectal surgery is, of course, a safe anastomosis, um, a low, a low leakage rate. And um, we invented and we routinely use since two years an autologous concentrate gain of human blood containing fibrinogen and uh, platelets, um, platelets to cover and to bring in the anastomosis. And I will show you briefly how it works technically and how it works functionally. And then I will show the, the first pre preliminary results of our first study. So it all starts just regular patient for colon or rectal surgery. And prior to the operation, you take just 120 milliliter of blood before the antibiotics, otherwise it wouldn't work before they get the single shot. You put this in a machine and everything is done by the machine. And then you get a concentrate of six milliliter, which you bring in the anastomosis, which I will explain and show you now. So the blood goes into this um, um, glass. Um, you put some citrate in, inside, otherwise you would have a coagulation, a clotting of the platelets. Um, then you put in a, PA, a, a puffer um, in order to get the pH low. Um, this is very important because we bring in this concentrate in the anastomosis from the patient's blood. It's an autologous transplantation and that might make someone of you thinking that we can spread tumor cells, but we have already the analysis and with a pH of four, there's no tumor cell surviving. So there's no risk of creating any local regional recurrence or carcinosis peritonei. Um, the fibrin is the crucial point of every healing and every coagulation process together with the platelets. On this picture, you can see non-activated platelets. So when we have an injury, for instance, you cut on your skin, there's blood coming out, the vessels are open, then the platelets come on the surface and then they will be activated like shown on the picture right. They are not smooth anymore. They cause dendrites in order to clot. And we bring in these non-activated platelets out of the blood taken from the patient in a fibrin matrix. So every single platelet, every single thrombocyte is covered with fibrin and stays inactive. So if we have an injury and if we bring together bowel ends, it's also a wound, um, the platelets usually, they start being activated and everything, everything concerning the wound healing, also in anastomotic healing, is triggered and is just regulated by activated platelets. And this is on the one hand, the coagulation cascade. And on the other hand, it's everything which is concerning with um, tissue growing, with engineering, with um, inflammatory response, all the factors like tissue growth factor, fibro fibroblast growth factor, um, endothelium growth factor, vascular endothelium growth factor, everything, everything, including uh, anti-immune bodies is triggered by the activated platelet. And um, the platelets are also responsible for uh, the growth factors, and they're also responsible for the immune for the immune reaction that we have no bound infection. So this is also this is all well documented. Now, one platelet usually is active for twenty hours. So if you make a skin incision, the blood comes out, the platelets are activated, and this takes. 20 hours. So all the information to the blood system, to your body, that there is a wound, we must come, the endothelium growth factors and everything, they get an information for 20 hours. What we do now, we collect the blood, we make a concentrate where we have platelets seven to 10 times higher than in a regular wound, and we inactivate them, covering them by fibrinogen. And when we have now a wound, the fibrin chain gets activated to fibrin, releases the platelet, and the platelet gets activated, which means that 
we have now some kind of retard version of the platelets being active for up to five to seven days. So we have the trigger for our body to try to heal the wound, not only 20 hours. We have this information for the body for five to seven days. And in the concentrate, the volume of platelets is up to 10 times higher than in a regular wound. So we have a double effect. We have the retard platelet version being active for seven days, and we have a concentrate of um, a tenfold volume of platelets. And this, in summary, should cause a better wound healing. Also, the antimicrobial, antimicrobial peptides. We have studies that um, um, factors which usually surgeons don't know, HPD2, HPD3, these are relevant, that we have no infection, no abscess in any wound. These are also triggered by activated platelets. The first studies on that has done by Lundquist showing a platelet rich factor fibrin called Vivostat. Maybe you know Vivostat. They could show the fibroblast cell count in this concentrate up to 90, 100 hours. So we can, we can create a concentrate where the fibroblasts are much more longer active and the fibroblasts have a higher volume. And the same we can now show with the platelets. Here is just one study um, uh, showing the activation of, um, if you can see here, PRGF is the platelet rich growth factor. Um, this is uh, um, fibrin, including a high volume of platelets. Um, the expression of these gains are in this group much more higher, significantly higher than in control groups. We did our first studies in pigs and checked the anastomotic healing. We put these matrix, which I will show in the videos immediately, inside and outside the anastomosis. So on the tissue where the staples from the stapler go through the tissue. And we could show electronic microscopically that each staple from the circular stapler is covered with this matrix. So the platelets, the activated platelets, are in the small holes of the staples. This is nowadays really maybe interesting due to the discussion of the microbiome. You know the story that maybe leakage is related to a small abscess in a small stitch uh, channel from the staple. Then from there, there's a created a little fistula. So we have this, this platelet activated um, matrix called Obsidian ASG for anastomosis safeguard in each staple channel. And on this study, we tried to show the effect on histologically and uh, also qualitative on, 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 on pigs. We operated together with our friends in Vienna 16 pigs. We made four groups. And uh, we, we had in one group, we had with three animals, all always in each group, uh, four pigs is three elements and animals, we had the, the obsidian and in one knot and these in each of these four groups. So 12 pigs had this, the obsidian and four pigs no. And then we sacrificed the pigs on day zero, day four, day 10 and day 30. And we made um, just a bacteriology uh, from the pelvis before the anastomosis and at the day when we um, sacrificed the pigs. And um, we could found, on the one hand, checking the anastomosis, that the bursting pressure is much more higher on day 10 and day 30 in the group with the obsidian ASG than in all the other groups. And we could show that the infection rate, that the bacteriological examination on the days after the anastomosis is significantly lower in the group with uh, obsidian as in the other group. Looking at anastomosis in the middle, you can see you can see a, a normal colon mucosa, and on the left side you can see the healing of anastomosis uh, on day four, on day ten, and on day thirty in the pig, um, which shows you here without obsidian um, irregular wound healing uh, disturbances. And if you look here um, on this picture on day third, including the obsidian HG matrix, it's nearly almost a regular 
completely comparable to the non-operated tissue. This shows that the wound healing is on histological basis much more better. Um, we sent these results to John Wicks, a pathologist in um, the United States, and he stated us that this technique is of importance and might because of the higher macrophage percentage and increased mucin content uh, better. He checked it and he said this might be really beneficial um, for better healing in the anastomosis. Now I show you a video. This was a cancer at the um, uh, upper third of the rectum, um, which um, had a low anterior section um, using, as I said, regularly, the easy end of flex stapler, um, usually in a regular rectum with the green cartridge. Um, and then for the anastomosis, um, you will see how this works. Um, you bring in the stapler from below. First, we check if there's a bleeding, and this is really surprisingly, we have no bleeding with these staplers. We do in each case, in each case, we do, we do ICG testing of the blood supply in order to make no failure here. Um, this is standard protocol for our study. And, um, and then I move a little further. Um, we bring in the easy end of leg circular stapler, and we bring in now this matrix, it's about six milliliter out of, out of 100 cent, uh, milliliter full blood. So we do an autologous transplantation of the obsidian matrix, which is, as I said, the thrombocytes covered with fibrin. And you can see here um, the, the, the substance is a good, it's sticky here. You can see everything is covered. Most important, the outside ring where the, where the staples are. And if we move further, we then we, we, we bring it, we close the machine and, uh, and then we bring it also outside. So the matrix will be inside each stitch channel of each single staple, and it will be also outside. This is very easily in, in, in circular stable anamosis. You can just turn the anastomosis to the left side, to the right side, and then you go underneath to, to really cover the posterior wall. I show you this going up the posterior wall, and that's it. At the end, after removing the machine, we always do flexible endoscopy on the right table. In Austria, surgeons are allowed to do flexible endoscopy, so we make a high pressure on the anastomosis. We check if there are some air bubbles coming out, and then everything is done. I show you the next video. This was um, also this was a, a sigmoid resection due to a perforated um, um, diverticulitis. Um, just um, six weeks. Uh, it was tected perforated, so no free perforation. Um, six weeks later on, she had abscess formation, which we could manage conservatively. And um, again, um, just at the level of the of the promontory a little lower at the upper rectum in the last third of the rectum. We staple, we check the, the, the staple line if there's any bleeding. Usually we don't have any bleeding here from the staple line. Uh, and then we bring in the anvil. We make ICG control, as I said. This is a standard in each single procedure um, where we do any kind and any type of intestinal anastomosis. We bring out the, the, the staple device and then we again, you can see the curved, the curved tip of the applicator. We bring in the matrix. It's very easy, it takes a few minutes more for the anastomosis. And then after bringing the ICT, the, the, the matrix, we close the anastomosis, we fire the anastomosis after bringing outside also the fibrin matrix circular around. Okay, the video is stuck now. I show you the next video, the last video from our 
clinic. So, okay. Here you can see a picture from inside before we had due anastomosis because it's recommended to do a testing of the anastomosis. This was a low rectal cancer, but nobody takes care of the primary stump of the stapling line. We always do the first flexible endoscopy, including water in the small pelvis. Before we do the stapling, then we bring in the matrix and then we do a second after the circular stapled anastomosis, we do a second um, testing of um, if, if the anastomosis is tight. So you can see the matrix here. You close, you, you do approximate the descending colon. And then you do the application of the, of the device also in low anastomosis which can be easily done by rotating the stapler, lifting up, uh, bringing down, turning to the right side, turning to the left side. So this is, this is easy to, to, to applicate in all situation. Now, I think the video is stuck a little, but you can imagine how it works. I, I think I, I move on and I show you now the first results. So we did a prospective trial after approval of the um, uh, ethical committee in our country. And uh, we started a non-randomized trial performing left colectomies and uh, um, rectum cancer surgery um, in all together with the uh, second hospital, the St. John's Hospital of God in Vienna. Um, we operated in in almost two years, um, 100, uh, 260 patients. So the operations are only done by experienced surgeons. So the trainee operations, not all included. And, um, and um, we used in all cases, uh, the, the products, you know, the easy end of legs and the easy CS staplers, uh, usually with uh, 28 centimeters, 28 millimeter diameter. And um, we did in all cases, as I said, the EICG. We did in all cases flexible endoscopy, and the primary endpoint was the anastomotic leakage. Um, we defined the le leakage like the Heidelberg uh, recommendation published by Rabari in 2010, um, um, how to define the leakage and uh, all major and minor complications have been evaluated according to Clavia Dindo. Um, and um, we check the anastomosis up to 40 day, 45 days after surgery, or if they had the lupulostomy in a, a very low anastomosis prior to the closure of the stoma. So these are the results. And uh, we had all this um, uh, um, diagnosis and uh, the ASA score and all other uh, illness the patients had, and if they had prior chemo radiation or not. And um, from, the, um, uh, from the technique, of course, in the, the colectomy group, it's almost the left sided. We had uh, um, hemicolectomy left or uh, uh, sigmoidectomy or anterior resection. Here, of course, the most of them was TME or low anterior resection. So the most interesting now, the results. We had four leak in the colon group, which is a leakage rate of 2.26%, and we had two leach in the rectum out of 84 patients, which is a leakage rate of um, 2.4, which is compared to the literature, astonishing and really uh, fantastic low. These cases, the first uh, um, rectal leakage was a lady, she had radio, uh, chemo radiation um, due to a, a recurrent, this was the third operation due to a carcinoma of the endometrium, it was on day three. And um, the second case was uh, also female, 73-year-old lady. She also had a just regular long-time radiochemotherapy. We do the operation um, 10 weeks after the radiation and she had the TME and uh, she had a leakage. So only two patients out of 84. 
um, which leads me to the conclusion to get a good anastomosis and a patient with colorectal surgery without um, um, uh, with colorectal surgery, the goal is to have a low morbidity and a low mortality. Therefore, we need a perfect preoperative segment, the perfect operation. Of course, you need uh, excellent stapling devices. And we have a new tool now, which is the first in the world uh, used in this study, which is under, under review in a paper now. Um, and um, I think this tool might really help to reduce anastomotic leakage. Um, the future is, um, which we already set up, a prospective randomized multinational uh, international um, multi-center trial. And uh, hopefully we will start with the next months with this study, including um, 440 rectal cancer patients, um, including obsidian ASG. So thank you very much for your attention and I will be here if any questions occur. Thank you. Very nice presentation. Uh, it's very nice subject uh, about obsidian ACG, uh, ASG. Uh, and uh, if there is any question from uh, the audience, please. Okay, I have uh, a comment. Uh, uh, a question for you, Professor. Uh, for uh, the first question is about uh, obsidian ASG. It is uh, still under uh, trial, uh, or it is for commercial use for international commercial use. It is available. It has the C mark. It is just for each clinic, for each colorectal surgeon, ready to use, and um, it's allowed to use it. And we use it in our clinic uh, routinely in each anastomosis, even in anastomosis for esophageal cancer and things like that. Okay. Uh, and about the time lag between the application of the, uh, the material and the stapling, is uh, there is any recommendation, or you just put the uh, to, uh, to put the material and then uh, do anastomosis directly? Directly. Nothing. No. No need to wait. No time lag. Okay. No. Okay. Do we thank have you very much. <laughs> Sorry. Do you have uh, any kind of idea of the price, the additional price? One application is about one eight hundred euro. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so we will move uh, to uh, the next subject, and it will be about the transanal total, total mesorectal excision uh, for low and mid rectal and adenocarcinoma. How we do it? Of course, uh, it is a very interesting subject and uh, growing. Uh, experience about the transanal TME uh, with Professor Murad Abid. Uh, he is the head of the Oncology Surgery Department, uh, Batna Anti-Cancer Center in Batna, Algeria. Thank you so much. Uh, you can see the presentation, the topic? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes, so, it's clear, yes. Thank you so much. So uh, first of all, I would like to thank you all for inviting, inviting myself to this webinar, Tarek and the Easy Search Medical Company. I have the pleasure to, today to talk to you about a very important uh, topic. I think it's the resection of uh, the rectal cancer and more precisely the middle and the low rectal adenocarcinoma. This subject is now, is now on by majority of colorectal surgeons and now the difficulty is found in the particular type of surgery. For years, we heard of a new way to treat this kind of tumors, which will be our topic today. One of the biggest, I think, uh, headways this uh, last year is the description of uh, total mesorectal excision by heel. And the second, I think, is uh, the introduction of laparoscopic surgery. So in the last year, we have a significant improve of survival rates and the standardization of TME with or without neoadjuvant therapy has decreased local recurrence in uh, risk. Nevertheless, as the colorectal surgeon developed more effective skills, they very quickly realized the difficulties of laparoscopic approach that can have, could have, especially in obese patients, male, 
and uh, who receive uh, radiation before. Uh, to give an example, to introduce an automatic clamp uh, to close the rectum below the, the tumor, more specifically in this case, remain extremely complicated when it comes to the cancer of the low and the middle rectum. You all colorectal surgeons know this. This difficulty led us to improve a new technique as a, a, a lot of colorectal surgeons around the world. But the implementation, the implementation of this kind of procedure is not easy and could be responsible of an opposite effect like we see in Norway. Uh, we will talk about this later. It's our subject, the subject of interest today. So how we do it or how we can to realize it. So first and number one, our department of oncologic surgery is one of the leading centers in Algeria when it comes to colorectal surgery with an average of 150 procedures of rectal cancer per year. Second uh, thing, the, the second thing is, uh, is now about 50, uh, 70 percent of rectal cancer surgery are done by laparoscopic in our department. We are proved to be an accredited center by the authorities in training of minimal invasive colorectal surgery. And we, uh, we also uh, specialized our, our uh, assistant in subspecialty like HBP surgery, hyper or procedure like laparoscopic surgery. In fact, the surgeon and me were facing for, uh, to difficulties when it comes to, to rectal surgery. It was then an absolute necessity to take a new technique in our department, totally response, uh, uh, respecting safety rules, which allowed us to avoid the Norway failure, like I say uh, uh, before. <coughs> so, The next logical step for laparoscopic surgery will be, I think, approach natural orifice, like no. Um, and what we can see. However, the progress has been shown due to the technical problem in performing this procedure safely. And um, safely. And we. Uh, by avoiding transabdominal incision and their related complications, not can procedure can in theory have a number of potential advantage over conventional laparoscopic approach for rectal uh, cancer. We will see now a video. So the first video, how we do, this is a man with uh, middle rectal cancer and we uh, use, in this case, a TATM. So we close first the rectum, like you see, when it's a middle rectum. Of course, the patient is on anesthesia, general anesthesia. So we, uh, I can see that you have two situations. The cancer of the lower rectum recurring uh, manual colonial anastomosis. In this case, we uh, start with an interstentarian dissection with a lone star. And for the middle rectum like this, we, uh, we, 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 do, uh, we, we close the rectum uh, with this stitch. And after this, we start the dissection. You see the dissection is very simple here. And we use only, in the majority of cases, the hook. I think it's a, a good uh, instrument for this, uh, this section. The, the, the dissection is continued posteriorly in contact of uh, the levator ani, muscle, fiber, and at uh, five and seven o'clock. And after, Anteriorly, the dissection is carried out on 1 and 11 o'clock in order to identify the recto urethral mu muscle in male or the vagina, the posterior vagina in a uh, woman.
So uh, before we uh, start this dissection, the first step is the, the, the placement of an umbilical trocar to explore the peritoneal uh, cavity to see if there is no carcinomatosis of uh, something like this, which uh, will be stop uh, the surgery. And this dissection is uh, sometimes we can use also some device like uh, this one. It's a ligature, you know it. Okay. So you can see that we are doing the dissection of all the mesorectum from the anus to the uterectum. Sometimes you have some difficulties to see because of the electrosurgery, but very quickly, quickly you, you, you use the aspiration to see, to have a, a nice pictures and to continue the dissection slowly and very, uh, so what I can see is, to use the electrosurgery, so like, okay. So if you uh, to take a better understanding of this subject, let's talk about some landmarks. It was in the, in the, in the past, uh, in the past year, that surgeon began to understand the problem of local recurrence. So thanks to the words of Gerard Bess and the Professor Hild, who described the exact technique of TRTMU and reduced the local recurrence. But the TRTMU starts in uh, 29, with Zoran and colleagues had described a new approach so the pre-rectal nodes access with down to up TMU. They reported their initial experience with transanal mobilization of the wall of the rectum. And two techniques were described, the use of colonoscopy and the use of transanal placid seals, port and standard laparoscopic instrument. Uh, the primary data showed that it was possible to perform an oncologic su successful resection in a selected group of patients. Then Sila and co-workers uh, described transanal dissection using a transanal endoscopic microsurgery proctoscope. She uh, reported the first clinic case of notes using TMU and laparoscopic assistant performed by a team you know, of a surgeon from Barcelona with Lassie and uh, a team of Boston. What were the conclusion? The conclusion were that Transanal endoscopic rectal sigmoid dissection using TUM and laparoscopic assistance is feasible and safe, but careful patient selection and improved instrument are critical to optimize the approach before with spare screenal application. And what say he about this? Uh, this TM, he said that it is a new solution for an old problem because there was a better quality of life with a high center, uh, center preservation, less conversion, less morbidity, and we can see that it was, was uh, more uh, reduced of rejection significance of positive uh, CRM rate and more center, center saving. But what was the, the problem? The problem was the, the major, uh, the, 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 the local recurrence. 
and the local recurrence you see after the TMU by uh, described by uh, Hild was very low. And what happened? It had it had that in Norway, uh, after they start this uh, procedure, they uh, have uh, a lot of uh, recurrence and with the median time recurrence uh, very uh, very short. So very clearly the the authorities of Norway stop these procedures because they say that it is uh, 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 not a good procedure and it, it will be responsible for um, a recurrence. But what we see that in uh, uh, expert center, this uh, introduction of, uh, of procedure was not responsible for multiple recurrence in the, learn in the learning curve, especially. This is the, the paper of, for example, of LASI, and you see that the local recurrence was 3.6%. Uh, it's very, uh, and, and, this, and, this, and this recurrence is very low, as you see. This is also, this curve show you that in the expert center, and when you use when you uh, are expert in colorectal surgery, you can introduce this uh, technique without a uh, very uh, uh, big risk. So in conclusion, this is a new approach could be used to, uh, to ensure a clear resection margin, reduce the number of conversion. We believe that the uh, adverse outcome reporting in the Norway are available by a stranger's patient selection, structured surgical training, and frequent performance of TRTME with uh, a high volume specialty team. So we are hopeful for the Color 3 multicenter trial that will give uh, some answer for uh, this. And now I will see, you, you will see the second, I think the second, The second video, which is in this case a woman, try to be, yes. So you see the MRI, we use a special device for this. You can see this. And this case, we start with a Lone Star and Antispectarial Dissection before the end to introduce in this uh, device. So in our department, this uh, procedure is now using for all middle and low adenocarcinoma. So you see the dissection is, is very simple here. And as I say, it's at uh, five o'clock and seven o'clock in the posterior area. And the anterior is at one o'clock and 11. So, Always what I say, I use only the hook here because we don't need to a special device for electrosurgery. Only when you have a lot of uh, blood or, but it uh, clearly never happened when you are in the good plane. So I think it's a, a nice dissection, <clears throat> but the colorectal surgeon here can also give me their uh, point of view. And we can, we, we can have an, an, a nice picture, nice uh, view of the mesorectum 
if you have uh, if you use also the aspiration sometimes so okay la, here we are in the ontario plane it's a women and the dissection may show us the posterior wall of the vagina. So I, this video, you can see it on the LinkedIn of my society, New Society of Surgery. I will speak about you uh, in one minute. So this is, when we are in the uh, anterior uh, plane, I use the ligature only in this case because there is hemorrhagia, uh, some bleeding here sometimes. And now the anastomosis. So we can do the anastomosis with the coloanal anastomosis or uh, manual anastomosis. Okay, so thank you so much. Uh, just I will uh, speak you about my uh, the the new uh, society of uh, digestive surgery and hepatobiliar surgery, which will uh, we do the first congress in Algeria on uh, uh, March uh, eighteen eighty two. So in the Health Regency of Algeria, and uh, this is the website of the society and. Uh, you are uh, invited, uh, I am inviting you to uh, participate to this uh, Congress. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Murad Abid, for this nice uh, uh, presentation. Uh, actually, it's a fastly growing topic uh, about uh, transanal total mesorectal excision. Uh, and I would like to ask if we have any question from the uh, participants. Um, what were your, your problems uh, implementing the technique uh, during the learning curve? What, what were your main problems, the main complication, intraoperative complication? I think. Sorry, I, we can't hear you. You can unmute, please, Professor Abid. Do unmute. So uh, for me, the, the, the problem for our, for our team, not just, by just for me, the problem was to, um, to have the, the, the good uh, plane in the first uh, cases. In the first cases, we were not very uh, good. I think I, we need for colloquial surgeon, now, who, you, who uh, do colloquial surgery every day, uh, perhaps 10, uh, cases to have a good uh, plan. So in the first cases, I think that it's not necessary to do the procedure until the um, until uh, to, to to select patients. Select patients. I mean, uh, patients who have not big tumors, a middle rectum, women, uh, not men, and after you can uh, use, but we don't have complication like urethral uh, um, section or something like this. Uh, the, the margin, as uh, I think today, all the margin was safe and uh, we don't have a, a mesorectum with a, not a nice dissection at, at, at this time, at this time. But we, 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 okay. we do it very carefully, very carefully and very, um, well, yeah, very carefully. Okay. Uh, yes, please. Um, yes, go. Thank you for Professor this excellent talk. We realized in our first series, which we started 10 years ago, that we had um, good oncological results, but bad functional results. So we had a high rate of patients suffering incontinence after this procedure. Did you realize this yourself as well? Um, it wasn't very clear, the, the sound. Can you repeat? Uh, so 
we we realized in our in our first series yeah can you hear me yeah yeah we, we, yeah i hear you but it's yeah. uh in in our first series we realized good oncological results but um, okay. the functional results we had okay. a, a high percentage of patients suffering incontinence and i said to myself maybe due to the long extension of the sphincter do you have same experience yeah, but I think that uh, the functional result is is not uh, is um, not very good. Also, for when you do a uh, coloanal by the by pure laparoscopic, when you do coloanal uh, anastomosis, you you have in the majority of cases not a good result, but sometimes with radiotherapy and uh, other things. So I think it's perhaps. Uh, for me, it's perhaps the same result in uh, the functional result. I, I don't think what uh, think the, the other colorectal surgeons, but in my experience, there is no more uh, morbidity in this uh, in this case. But what I I insist that for me, the oncologic result is perhaps more important than the functional result. Uh, because relapse and the risk of recurrence is more important than uh, the area of something like this. So you can, uh, okay, you can manage it. Okay. But the risk of recurrence is, is not, uh, is, not is, 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 is a catastrophe, so, yes. <clears throat> uh, okay, Professor uh, Murad, I have also, uh, one question or maybe two. Uh, I would like to, uh, you, you said at the end of the presentation that you do uh, the anastomosis uh, stapled or hand soon. Uh, what type yeah. you prefer? Uh, what what, what do you prefer the, to do? Uh, for me, it's the hand. For me, for me, but, but, but I have two assistants. They, but we, uh, we have to standardize this, uh, standardize this, uh, this, this problem. If you are in the in the middle rectum. I think that the stapler is better, but because you can close, you can close with uh, with the stitch and do the anastomosis like uh, they do in Barcelona. But if, if you are in the low rectum, it, I think it's not possible. And the the manual, the the, yes. the coloanal directly used by hand is uh, is the solution. I okay. I have the same uh, opinion also about uh, the transcranial uh, total mesorectal excision about the hand soon asmos. I think it's better than stapled and sealed and asmos in ultra low. Uh, uh, and also, uh, do you protect the anastomosis? Do you do covering ileostomy for all the ultra low resections? Okay. When it's uh, hand uh, anastomosis. I think we can we can uh, don't use the the illusory. but uh, in the majority of cases majority of cases not we uh, use illustomy only in if the patient is very old you know uh, after uh, uh, the patient which is very uh, not very young, I think it's not uh, a good idea because uh, the diarrhea and the, 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 the deperdition in uh, metabolic, etc., can have also a morbidity, can, to be, uh, can be a morbidity. So when you, we, we use it, we uh, try to close it very, uh, very rapidly, perhaps okay. 10 days, after the illustomy, we can do it. If the okay. if, if if the if the the the, the, the CT scan is okay. Okay, and uh, about the uh, energy source, uh, uh, you said that sometimes you use uh, ligature uh, uh, or advanced bipolar uh, uh, technology as uh, the source of energy, and uh, sometimes you prefer hook. Uh, I have a comment, uh, and I want to hear your opinion. Uh, I think in transanal uh, 
total mesorectal excision surgery, it's preferable uh, or uh, for me as a personal experience because uh, it's, I prefer to use book because the ligature or the sealing devices in general, they fuse the tissues and it's very difficult to find back the tissue again uh, or the proper plane again. So this is my opinion. What do you think? I, I, I think you have, uh, it, this is a good opinion. Uh, the hook is, uh, is, is, um, is a good device in this, but you can, you must have the good plane. It's, it, it's, yes, it's sure. um, when you have the good plane, it's very simple to do with a hook. Uh, sure. but, uh, so you don't need, we don't need some devices like Ligasur or, or yes. other okay. electrostatic. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. And uh, at the end of this uh, topic, I'd like to uh, send many thanks and many gratitude to uh, Bill Hild, of course, that you mentioned, because he is the master of the mesorectal excision, of the total mesorectal excision. And the leaders in the transamal total mesorectal uh, excision surgery is uh, Antonio Lacey and uh, Sam Atalla and the people who led uh, us in this way, because I think it, uh, it is a revolution. So we will move to the uh, next subject. Uh, and it is, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Leon Magori. He is the Professor of Surgery, uh, Surface du, uh, du Chirurgia Digestive Oncologique uh, in uh, Hospital St. Louis in France. And we will uh, uh, give us a lecture about how, how can we improve the functional results following the rectal cancer surgery. And it's a very important topic. Thanks. Thank you very much for this uh, kind introduction. It's a very, uh, it's a huge pleasure for me to, to uh, speak about that topic. Can you see my slides? Yeah. Yes, yes, we can see it. Perfect. Okay, thank you. So, uh, uh, so as I said, it, it's a huge pleasure to, to do a, a presentation on that topic, the topic of functional results following low rectal cancer surgery. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's good news to make that kind of topic, mainly because uh, this topic uh, is raising now because oncological management of rectal cancer is now under control. Uh, we all know that the local recurrence rate of rectal cancer surgery is quite low. We, we are all trying to lower uh, that rate, but it's not the uh, oncological question anymore. Like you, should, you shouldn't die of primary rectal cancer without uh, metastasis. Now it's under control. So for most of our patients, the functional result has become a major endpoint uh, for the patient. There are no not asking us if they're gonna die of their disease, but how will they end up with what kind of functional result they will have uh, at the end of the management. So uh, obviously uh, digestive functional results after rectal cancer surgery is uh, impaired. We all know that uh, it's uh, uh, very well described uh, uh, in the low anterior resection uh, score, the last score, so we all know that score. Uh, it's interesting to note that uh, this score was published quite recently in 2012. We had, we had to wait a long time to have a, a real good score describing the digestive functional result after uh, rectal cancer surgery. We all know that uh, the last score is ranging from 0 to uh, 42. Uh, and it, the functional result is worse as the score is going high. We have a major loss for uh, patients with a loss score more than 30. So why do we have an impaired functional result after rectal surgery? So mainly because of uh, four reasons, neurologic trauma, a sphinctering trauma, uh, a rectal reservoir removal because of the surgery and because of pelvic sclerosis. So we will uh, discuss all that topics in that presentation and then we will discuss a bit about the management, what we can do uh, with difficult functional results. So obviously the first problem is the uh, nerve trauma. What can we do against the, the trauma of the nerve? So obviously the first thing is to have an optimal surgical technique. Um, 
minimize nervous injury. So to do that, we should reach high time mesenteric ligation, dissection strictly in the TMA plane, which is obvious, hypogastric nerve uh, preservation. So uh, what Bill Hill said uh, is uh, you should uh, first dissect the posterior plane, then the anterior plane, and then uh, do the lateral dissection to avoid as much as possible any kind of hypogastric nerve uh, uh, trauma. And obviously in men, if it can be done because of the tumor, dissection is performed posterior to the denominator's fascia. Uh, we all know that this uh, optimal surgical technique is difficult. We had uh, just uh, here a presentation about TRTME, which is highlighting the problem of the technical problem of the rectal surgery. Rectal surgery is difficult. We all try to uh, improve the technique, to improve uh, the approach. We know that, um, sorry, we all, we, we know that uh, laparoscopic approach did not increase, did not improve uh, our functional results and our rates of uh, nerves injury, which was a, a bit disappointing. Uh, we had hope uh, toward the robotic approach, but uh, if you look at in the roller uh, trial, we know now that the robotic approach does not uh, limit nervous injury as compared to the laparoscopic approach. The, uh, the thing is exactly the same. I'm sorry, the title uh, are in French, but functional uh, results in men, women, and uh, urological results are exactly the same uh, uh, if you compare laparoscopic approach to robotic approach. Uh, and if you look at the TATME, uh, obviously this is still an experimental technique. We do not have at the present time any kind of randomized control trial, but if you look at the meta-analysis uh, published uh, last year, you can see that there is probably no difference between uh, TATME or standard uh, laparoscopic uh, TME uh, regarding the functional result. TME, TATME does not, maybe does not help to reduce the nerve uh, injury. So uh, the second uh, topic is the sphincteric trauma. We all know that now for rectal cancer surgery, we are uh, going to a tailored approach uh, to try and preserve uh, as much as possible uh, of the rectum. So what the objective that we need to reach is a centimeter uh, digestive distal margin. This is obviously because of oncological reasons, but we need to keep in mind that we do not need to have more than one centimeter digestive uh, distal margin. I've, I do not think it's a good idea to perform a, a, um, a, a total mesorectal uh, excision for very high uh, rectal uh, uh, cancer because of the functional result that you will have and you, you won't have any kind of oncological uh, advantage to remove more and more uh, rectum. So obviously if you can do a staple anastomosis it will be associated to a better outcome, functional outcome, uh, as compared to uh, a manual anastomosis uh, if you do not have uh, an anastomotic leakage, obviously. So intersphincteric dissection is interesting to uh, um, try and uh, perform um, a, sphin a sphincter setting procedure, but it has a price uh, regarding the, the functional result that patient will be uh, exposed, as you can see on this meta-analysis, uh, the perfect continence uh, in patients who had an intensosteric resection is only achieved in uh, a bit more than half of the patients. So uh, half of the patients will have some kind of incontinence after uh, rectal cancer surgery, which is obviously really impairing for their quality of life. So the third problem is the rectal reservoir removal. So we all know that if we remove the rectum, the rectum won't be able to do its job as a reservoir uh, for the stool. So we, uh, for a long time, had uh, the idea to replace uh, the rectal reservoir by a new reservoir, colonic reservoir. So as you all know, uh, several kinds of reservoir were um, proposed. We have the J-pouch, 
on the left, the coloplasty, on the right, the lateral anastomosis in the middle. Uh, these were uh, highly um, uh, assessed in several randomized control trial. Uh, uh, you know that uh, the coloplasty on the right was uh, abandoned by uh, the majority of the teams because uh, it's difficult to make and it's uh, associated, associated to a higher rate of uh, a leakage, but uh, uh, a lot, a lot, the majority of surgeons are performing to a partial lateral anastomosis if they do a total mesorectal excision. This was uh, proposed in a colorectal, uh, oh, sorry, in a Cochrane meta-analysis, which uh, clearly assessed uh, the J pouch as uh, associated to an improved functional result as compared to a direct anastomosis. The problem with this meta-analysis is that all uh, included randomized control trial uh, uh, had a follow-up of less than uh, two years. The maximum follow-up was to, uh, 18 months uh, in the randomized control trial, which were included in the Cochrane meta-analysis. So we didn't know exactly if uh, these uh, improved functional results were uh, staying uh, as, as much as good uh, with time. The, this is a really recent um, a randomized control trial which was published in our surgery from a team from Switzerland, the SAC uh, trial. Uh, which uh, the idea was to compare the direct anastomosis to the J pouch to uh, the uh, side to arm uh, anastomosis with a, a, a longer follow up, with at least two years of follow up. It was uh, a really good uh, randomized control trial from a methodological perspective. The only thing is that the primary endpoint is a bit complex because it's a composite uh, score and functional result which wasn't. Uh, validated in the literature, but still you can see that uh, there is no difference, no difference, no significant difference, at least uh, if you compare the three groups. So uh, this recent uh, um, randomized control trial uh, asked the question, is the pouch really useful? We do not know exactly at the present time if it's so uh, useful as we initially uh, so, so this uh, first uh, idea that maybe uh, not to perform a pouch might be interesting led uh, some surgeons to uh, do a step uh, beyond. If you do not have to do a pouch, maybe you can do a delayed colonial anastomosis. I don't know, maybe all of you know that uh, technique, but the delayed colonial anastomosis was. Uh, used years ago uh, uh, in several uh, teams, the Cleveland Clinic uh, performed uh, a trial which assessed that it was associated to a uh, reduced rate of anastomotic leakage. The idea is to have a transonal colonic stump, which you can cut uh, as a second step of surgery on postoperative day eight or 10, leaving the adhesion in place and to perform a manual anastomosis. So if you uh, know that you don't have to do uh, a pouch, you can do uh, that technique maybe without any kind of stoma uh, because it will uh, be associated to a re uh, reduce rate of anastomotic leakage. There is a, an interesting uh, Italian randomized control trial which was published uh, last year in JAMA surgery uh, a bit more of 100 patients randomized between the two techniques, direct anastomosis with stoma or delayed colon anastomosis without uh, stoma, obviously. The uh, uh, results are interesting because, as you can see, the, the, the rate, the risk of leakage was exactly the same in the, in the two groups, so it might be an interesting idea, but the problem is that uh, when you look at the functional results, there is, yes, no significant statistical difference in uh, the two groups, but that trial was not designed uh, toward a functional result outcome. And you can see that the mean last score uh, in uh, the direct uh, anastomosis with stoma uh, group was uh, something about 30, and it was 36 
so pretty bad in the uh, delayed coronal uh, group. So maybe with the delayed coronal astrosis, it's a good idea because you will have less leakage, but maybe a bit of an impaired uh, functional result. So it's not uh, the uh, maybe the primary idea to do uh, that kind of uh, uh, technique. Fourth uh, problem, the pelvic sclerosis. We all know uh, that pelvic sclerosis has a multifactorial uh, origin. The first thing is obviously pelvic uh, irradiation, I mean, neoadjuvant radiotherapy. So uh, we know uh, from the, um, the Dutch uh, randomized control trial that uh, pelvic irradiation uh, impairs uh, functional results. As you can see on this slide, the rate of patients with major or minor LARS was uh, quite uh, larger than uh, in the, sorry, in the radio uh, chemotherapy group as compared to the no radio chemotherapy group. But we, we, we need to remember also that the pelvic sepsis, the uh, anastomotic leakage is also associated to an impaired outcome because of, a, of a, an increased uh, pelvic sclerosis. Uh, this was a paper published in 2016, and uh, we uh, showed that the symptomatic uh, leakage was associated to a higher rate of major loss in patients as compared to patients without any kind of uh, uh, leakage. So, uh, uh, for the majority of surgeons, the best idea, the best thing to do to reduce the risk of anastomotic leakage is to perform a diverting stoma. And this uh, was the idea of this uh, randomized control trial from Mattison in uh, 2007, showing that uh, the diverting stoma lower the risk of anastomotic leakage in rectal cancer surgery. The problem is that diversion to have uh, a diverting stoma and therefore to have a diverted uh, colon, colon and colon anastomosis might impair by itself uh, the, the functional result. This is um, uh, um, I'm sorry, this is a paper from uh, randomized control trial and they assess that diverting stoma uh, was uh, um, sorry, uh, a predictive factor in multivariate analysis of uh, impaired outcome. Maybe because uh, if the, the, the surgical montage, the, the colon is diverted and not used uh, as um, for many time, uh, the, the, the functional outcome will be uh, impaired uh, uh, after uh, the stomach closure. So what can we do? about that. So the first idea, obviously, is to have the stoma uh, for a minimal time. So uh, as it was said before, early stoma closure uh, after rectal surgery is uh, feasible, uh, is doable. This is, there are two randomized control trials on that topic. The, the, the last one is uh, on that slide. It was published in 2017 in adult surgery, a bit more than 100 patients, as you can see. Uh, there is no uh, increased risk of leakage if you uh, close the anastomosis at uh, eight uh, days versus uh, 12 weeks. Uh, so uh, this can be done. Uh, obviously, uh, this uh, lead uh, to some organizational problem to, to close the stoma at uh, day eight because you need to have a CT scan to assess everything on the eight, uh, but still it's doable and it might be a good idea regarding to uh, the functional results. If you look at uh, the functional outcome of the same randomized control trial, you can see that uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, the functional results overall was the same in the two groups, but uh, there was some kind of improvement in the early stomach closure group with a reduced urgency rate uh, in the early stomach group. So this might be a good idea to improve uh, the functional result after uh, stomach closure. But the step beyond is to not divert at all. Obviously, there are two strategies uh, regarding that idea. The, the strategy is followed by Willem Bemelman in, the, uh, in Amsterdam is to not divert at all, to uh, do the rectal cancer surgery, do not divert any kind of patient 
then to have a post-operative careful screening and do a secondary uh, stoma if there, if there are any kind of problem. That they published that uh, paper showing that there was no uh, increased risk of long-term stoma uh, doing that strategy. And we have in France a uh, uh, randomized control trial which will start at the end of the year, uh, which will assess uh, according to a risk factor score, uh, two kind of strategy, two groups, uh, patients with a high risk uh, of uh, leakage stoma and patients with uh, a low or intermediate risk of uh, leakage, no stoma, and then a post-operative post careful screening we will have the results in something like two or three years. So last uh, part of the presentation, what can we do? if we have uh, uh, not so good uh, functional results. So the first thing, obviously, to always search for an organic problem. Is there an anastomotic structure? Is there some kind of local recurrence? This is obvious, but still we, we should uh, try uh, and uh, look at that kind of problem anytime. And the second thing is to be patient. Functional results will improve uh, with time. This is very well demonstrated. And obviously, it will improve with the end of the adjuvant chemo if the patient has some kind of adjuvant chemo because this uh, impairs the functional results, obviously. The first step is to have some kind of medical uh, treatment. The, the objective is to regularize the stool consistency, so dietary measures, obviously, low pyramid, but not too much. Uh, careful of the patient with too, uh, too much low pyramid, which are, in fact, uh, constipated and have a false uh, diarrhea. Uh, so I use uh, usually a lot of times some laxative, which might be regarded as paradoxal for uh, some patient, which works. Uh, and you have to uh, work against uh, minimized uh, obstructive defecation with uh, some kind of suppository or enemas. The next step is pelvic floor rehabilitation. This works. Uh, this is a systematic review published in 2014, which clearly showed that the pelvic floor rehabilitation improves uh, functional results. The problem, obviously, is to find uh, um, someone to do the pelvic floor rehabilitation without any kind of uh, problems uh, regarding the anastomosis. So you shouldn't do that with some kind of transonal balloons or, so, or something like that, because you can impair your, your anastomosis and you can have some uh, late uh, uh, um, leakages. Transcendental irrigation, uh, this works also. Uh, this is a small study, but still it exists. A prospective study, 14 patients, and this improves uh, quality of life in major LARS patients. The idea is to have a transcendental probe with a small balloon which can be inflated, then you will have an improved uh, irrigation, transcendental irrigation uh, to perform an NMS of the, of the distal uh, column. Sacral neurostimulation also works. Uh, we don't know why, but uh, who cares? It works. Uh, uh, sacral uh, neurostimulation improves the symptom of the low entire section score after uh, rectal cancer surgery. This has been reported last year in that uh, paper. If nothing else works, you can uh, go a step uh, beyond toward anterograd irrigation with a secostoma or malum procedure, which obviously improves quality of life, but with the problem of, have, of having uh, a daily NMS with a secostoma, which is obviously uh, a problem. Uh, and if you try and perform some kind of algorithm, uh, uh, during the post-operative early period, usually get the remissures laxative after six months after surgery, uh, because your anastomosis will be completely healed and you will have uh, maybe a less uh, high risk of uh, leakage if you do some kind of transal uh, maneuvers, enema rehabilitation, transcendental irrigation, and after a year, sacral nervous stimulation or enterograd uh, irrigation. So in conclusion, uh, you have to work against nerve injuries, sphincteric trauma, the, the, the problem of the uh, pouch. So uh, still, uh, is it really necessary to make a pouch? We don't know exactly yet. 
uh, you need to work against uh, post-operative pelvic sclerosis. Uh, and maybe, obviously, the solution will be not to perform radical surgery, to perform watch and wait strategies, or maybe um, transonal uh, scar removal after a complete response. Uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Lyon, for uh, this uh, nice presentation. Actually, it is uh, a very interesting topic. Uh, also, uh, the functional outcome. Uh, and uh, we all suffer from patients post-operatively that uh, they have uh, different types of functional outcome uh, uh, and you cannot uh, anticipate uh, they are complaining from diarrhea or constipation or obstructed defecation. So uh, is uh, there any question from the uh, participants? Yeah, can I have a question? Yes, please. Yes. Uh, thank you for uh, your presentation. Uh, did you, when you have um, not a good result, and when all this uh, this kind of uh, treatment don't works, did you have to transform uh, a colonal to a definitive stoma in some patient? Yeah, yeah, obviously, uh, obviously. Um... Uh, obviously, some patients are asking for uh, a definitive stoma because of uh, bad functional results. Uh, yeah. So the, this, this might be uh, related to a lot of factors. And I, I'm not sure it's exactly the same rate. If you look at different countries, I think that in uh, Mediterranean countries like mine or yours, uh, the, the, the idea of having a definitive stoma uh, it's not well accepted. So uh, at least in France, not a lot of patients are asking for a definitive stoma. They are, they are trying to keep with the anatomical uh, complete uh, route. Uh, but, but, but we have something like 10% of bad functional results which are asking for uh, a stoma. Yeah, of course, this happens. Thank you. Okay, do we have any other question or comment? Okay, I have also a comment about uh, uh, the uh, uh, treatment of uh, patients who suffers from uh, persistent uh, uh, symptoms uh, with and low anterior section syndrome. Uh, I think also, uh, like you said, uh, some sorts of uh, anti-grade enemas like maloon operation gives good results in uh, these patients who suffer uh, without response to treatment, uh, without the definite stoma. So it's a, a very small opening. They can uh, wash themselves through the, uh, through the colon. I think it's a proper option also uh, because I, I, I have a comment and also I'm waiting for your opinion. Uh, once uh, the uh, functional uh, the outcome after surgery is not satisfactory for the patient, it will be always not satisfactory, regardless the treatment and uh, either enemas or glycine suppositories or any other uh, option. Uh, what do you think about this? I, I, I really, we have, a, we have a, some patient which we, in, in which I perform a, a malone procedure or secostoma, and now the idea is that they can, our endoscopists are doing some uh, endoscopic secostoma, which are, which, is, which are really easy and, and works really well. Uh, so I completely agree with you. Yeah, uh, this uh, improves quality of life in, uh, in patients with uh, bad function uh, after, uh, after surgery. The problem is that uh, in tirograde animals, it takes an hour, uh, something like an hour or two, every morning so uh, it's not it's you know it's 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 not that easy it's not uh, that okay for patients okay so thank you very much professor uh, magori and uh, we will move uh, to the last subject in our uh, seminar uh, today uh, with professor uh, mohammed bin ammar uh, he is a professor in general surgery in Faculty of Medicine at Safakis uh, uh, in uh, Tunisia. And uh, his subject will be, uh, can we reduce the rate of anastomotic leak in uh, the surgery of rectal cancer? Uh, please proceed. Thank you. 
Uh, I'm uh, so glad to be with you uh, this uh, morning. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I, uh, in the beginning, I would like uh, to uh, thank uh, Tarak Puri and uh, AZ Surge Medical for uh, joining uh, this panel of eminent exper international experts to present this topic. Uh, I will, uh, uh, with uh, this presentation, uh, try to uh, answer the question, can we reduce the rate of anastomotic leak in the surgery of rectal cancer? As you know, anastomotic leak is a serious complication of, of, uh, of this surgery. Uh, there is a poor prognosis, mortality can reach uh, 30%. Uh, final stoma can reach uh, 100%. The incidence uh, is uh, variable, uh, 5 to 15 after colorectal or coloanal anastomosis. The incidence of uh, anastomotic leak uh, is influenced uh, by factors related to the patient and his disease, preoperative preparation, and surgical uh, management. So, uh, our objective, uh, according to the principle of evidence based medicine, to try to identify the risk factors of anastomotic leak in rectal cancer, and uh, to review the various uh, technical details uh, that reduce the rate of anastomotic leak. Our methodology is uh, to, to do research in electronic bibliography review, uh, three uh, databases, Medline, Ombas, Cochrane Library, uh, until uh, 2010. And uh, according to the principle of uh, evidence, based surgery, uh, we classify the publication in decreasing way according to the robustness. So meta-analysis after that, randomized trials, prospective studies, and uh, retrospective, uh, retrospective studies. And uh, we use uh, the classification of Oxford, March 2009, uh, with the level of evidence. Uh, center of the medicine and level one strong comparative randomized trials meta analysis, uh, level two uh, weak comparative randomized trials, and uh, level uh, three of evidence well conducted contemporary non randomized control style. The first part of this presentation will take with the risk factors of anastomotic leak in rectal cancer surgery. The factors uh, studied uh, surgeon experience blood supply and coagulation, optimized and preoperative fluid management, contamination or sepsis of the surgical site, and their nutrition, pelvic irradiation, and other factors. We find uh, one meta-analysis, two reviews, nine uh, uh, prospective studies, two multicentric studies, and six, uh, six uh, retrospective studies. Surgeon experience is the determining factor uh, and uh, with the level uh, of evidence too, an experienced surgeon will have less anastomotic, uh, anastomotic leak. Blood supply and coagulation, uh, as, uh, as uh, the presentation of uh, Professor Andreas, to, give, uh, to have a good uh, anastomosis and a good cicatrization, we need a good microcirculation, so uh, platelet aggregation, activation of coagulation, growth uh, fibroblast. And when there is a situation what, uh, when uh, we find exaggerated coagulation activation, like uh, there is microthrombosis that decreases uh, the blood flow peri-anastomotic. So we, can, we have uh, ischemia and uh, fistula. Other uh, problem is the vascular feed of the patient uh, in elderly uh, subject or uh, subject suffer for, uh, from atherosclerosis or hypertension or smoking. So we can uh, conclude with the level four because uh, there is no strong uh, studies. Improving fluid supply and coagulability may reduce the rate of anastomosis. Plague. Optimized intraoperative fluid management reduced the rate of anatomous leak as well as the rapid restoration of uh, the transit. So, uh, this is with the level two of uh, uh, evidence. Uh, contamination or sepsis of the seat, it's uh, of the surgical seat, is uh, an independent risk factor. 
uh, we find the systematic uh, review uh, which is published uh, in uh, 2013 the, uh, and the, uh, we, uh, the authors conclude that the contamination of the digestive uh, tract in elective gastrointestinal surgery by antiprophylaxy reduces the rate of anastomosis. So, uh, uh, infection control could reduce the rate of anastomotic leak. Under nutrition, serum, uh, serum low albumin and serum low protein are two markers of undernutrition and are uh, significant, significantly associated with the anastomotic leak in two uh, studies and uh, with the level uh, uh, of uh, evidence uh, three, preoperative correction of undernutrition could reduce the rate of anastomotic leak. We find also uh, three studies uh, of the use of oral impact and two others uh, for the use of uh, the uh, product uh, from the impact range in preoperatively for major abdominal surgery for the adults. And uh, also we find in one meta-analysis included 13 randomized control trial, uh, 1,069 patients evaluate the validity of perioperative immunization for patients which are candidate to digestive surgery of cancer and uh, the, the, the recommendation of hot utility of health uh, in uh, French, oral impact perioperative nutrition of adults patients who are candidates for measured oncologic digestive surgery. We administrate uh, this uh, on preoperatively for all patients regardless of their nutritional status or postoperatively oh, and postoperatively in case of denutrition with the level one of uh, um, evidence. For pelvic irradiation, as we uh, said in the, the, the uh, presentation of uh, uh, Professor Leon, the role of preoperative pelvic irradiation has long been controversial, but analysis of the results of control studies shows that is it does not increase the risk of anastomosis leak. So with the level two of evidence, pelvic irradiation doesn't, doesn't increase the risk of anastomosis leak. Other factors related to the field of the person, smoking, alcoholism, gender male, obesity as a score under two, diabetes, factors also related to the disease under peritoneal anastomosis, emergency surgery, occlusion infection, so uh, the level of uh, the anastomosis and the presence of associated risk factor can determine the indication of uh, uh, diverting stoma uh, and, and this is uh, an expert agreement. This is the part one of the presentation. The part two, the technical details that reduce the rate of anastomotic leak, technical details studied, mechanic, Colon colic preparation, manual versus mechanical anastomosis, single stapling versus double stapling mechanical anastomosis, direct versus reservoir anastomosis, laparotomy versus laparoscopy, intraoperative testing of the anastomosis, stoma derivation, pelvic drainage, and other technique device like uh, the device uh, described by uh, Professor Andreas. We find uh, 10 meta analyses two systematic reviews, six prospective randomized studies, and one uh, consensus of uh, the French Federation uh, of uh, Cancer Digestive and uh, two retrospective studies. Mechanical uh, presentation, we find uh, the Gregor III uh, randomized multicenter uh, study. And the conclusion, the administration of mechanical bowel preparation decreases the risk of severe symptomatic fistula. Other study suggests rectal lavage alone. Also the Italian test, uh, which uh, the, uh, began in uh, 2013 and are published last year, and uh, it has uh, been uh, described by uh, Professor Leon. We conclude from all these uh, studies that mechanical pre uh, preparation erectile cancer surgery is recommended to decrease the severity and not uh, the incidence of anastomo, uh, anastomosis leak. 
but uh, also rectal lavage alone may become an alternative in the future avec level of evidence too. Manual versus mechanical, we find uh, uh, one meta Cochrane meta-analysis meta -analysis, uh, published in uh, 2001 and updated 2011. One meta other meta analysis of uh, 13 uh, randomized pairs, there was no significant difference in anthomos lack. But manual anastomosis take more time to realize and mechanical anastomosis uh, 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 is uh, responsible of uh, more stenosis. So we co can conclude with the level of evidence. Uh, one, no difference between the two techniques uh, uh, from the ancestors of uh, anastomotic uh, leak. Single stapling versus uh, double stapling mechanical anastomosis. We find one random randomized controller field and to cite anastomosis give less than anti-end anastomosis, five versus 29%. We find also two meta-analysis uh, in 2012 and the other. And the, the conclusion, the use of lateral lateral mechanical anastomosis give less uh, anastomotic leak than uh, the other techniques with the high uh, low of evidence. Direct uh, versus uh, reservoir anastomosis. Uh, there is uh, two, uh, one meta analysis uh, in uh, 2006 and uh, systematic review in uh, 2007. So performing an anastomosis with a G reservoir would reduce the risk of anastomotic leak with a high level of evidence. Laparotomy versus laparoscopy. We uh, found a review of uh, 17 randomized clients uh, and uh, we don't find any difference between the two techniques. So laparoscopy does not expose the risk of anastomotic leak with uh, level one uh, of evidence. Intraoperative testing of the anastomosis. Uh, several techniques are uh, were uh, tested: Doppler uh, flow measurement, uh, fluorescence, infrared uh, uh, intraoperative colonoscopy. But uh, I find uh, two uh, uh, random uh, randomized uh, from uh, 998 cases uh, for the air test, and uh, the air test could have the rate. Uh, of uh, the anastomotic leak. So uh, we, we, this is the presentation uh, of uh, and uh, to uh, uh, lateral lateral anastomosis for female. And we can find uh, the rectal monium. Uh, we introduce a circular stapler. And uh, during, uh, uh, we, uh, during the process of uh, retracting the anvil, uh, to close uh, the instrument, uh, ensure that uh, no extra uh, neous uh, tissue to, to have uh, uh, good anastomosis. This is uh, lateral uh, and two side uh, anastomosis. So we, we must be sure that uh, there is no extraneous uh, tissue between uh, the two parts of the anastomosis. We, uh, we verify, uh, we can uh, also uh, testing the stapler, uh, uh, stapler the colorectal uh, anastomosis by, uh, by filling uh, the pelvis with a, a saline solution. And uh, we uh, introduce the air using Guillaume uh, syringe. Uh, and uh, we must verify if there is no bubbles uh, because where there is bubbles, uh, it indicates the anastomosis lack, which must be resolved uh, during surgery. Diverting the stoma, uh, the indication of uh, diverting, uh, diverting stoma, poor general condition of the patient, low lying tumor, narrow pelvis in men especially, and short rectal stump with poor uh, blood supply, uh, essentially in uh, TNO. Uh, so we find one prospective study of 1,018 consecutive cases that recommend stoma in case of predictive factor of anastomotic leak, and one meta-analysis of uh, 
12 comparative studies, including five randomized trials. So, uh, in your Use tommy uh, give uh, less prolapse and septic complications than a colostomy, but more occlusion and dehydration. We can conclude uh, that the diverting stoma is recommended in case of risk factor of anastomotic leak. It does not decrease the rate of anastomotic leak, but minimizes their severity. Iliostomy is preferred uh, or uh, over colostomy at the level one of uh, evidence. We do or not uh, pelvic drainage. We find the uh, Cochrane meta analysis, 1,140 patients, six, uh, six randomized trials. There was no significant difference in anastomosis between two groups. Drainage is uh, justified in uh, the event of technical difficulties, bleeding, uh, peritonitis, especially in uh, emergency situation. The French uh, Society of uh, Cancer of uh, Digestive Cancer uh, recommend with uh, the expert agreement suction drain in case of subperitoneal anastomosis. So we can conclude pelvic drainage is not recommended as a routine drainage uh, with a high uh, level of evidence, but uh, it is uh, recommended in case of subperitoneal anastomosis with the agreement expert. Other technical device uh, like a piploplasty, reinforcement of the stapel line, uh, as we uh, see with uh, Professor Andreas, intraperitoneal substance, uh, gentamicin, alloderm, propofil, bioactive, uh, or other. We must uh, wait uh, the, the results of prospective study, uh, uh, like uh, uh, such as uh, oxidant. So we can conclude, uh, and uh, uh, the answer is yes. We can reduce the rate of anastomotic leak in the surgery, but we, uh, with uh, experience in the hands, uh, ensure good blood supply and good coagulability, antibiotic prophylaxis and optimized fluid management, correct undernutrition, perform a preoperative mechanical preparation in the rectum, uh, prefer lateral lateral mechanical anastomosis. For low anastomosis, you uh, use uh, uh, G-shaped reservoir. In the presence of risk factor of anastomotic leak, perform ileostomy and suction drain, and uh, uh, research continue. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Mohamed uh, Ben Ammar, for uh, this nice uh, presentation. Uh, and also it remains the topic of uh, post-operative anastomotic leakage in colorectal anastomosis, a very hard issue to discuss. Uh, do we have any comment or uh, question from the floor? Yeah, perhaps. Excuse me, yes, do, do you have any experience with ICG uh, to reduce uh, the anastomosis leakage. Yeah. So, so, so there's some others. Uh, yes. yes. Some other, there is no uh, evidence-based uh, uh, results. The only uh, air test and the others. There is no <coughs> evidence of result, results. Thank you. Any other question? Okay, I have uh, just a query about the mechanical bowel preparation because, uh, as I know, uh, many centers, uh, uh, many centers now uh, try to avoid the mechanical bowel preparation, and on the contrary, they say that uh, it may uh, washing out uh, the uh, commensal bacteria and the bacterial flora of the colon and rectum may be one of the causes uh, that uh, increase the incidence of uh, leakage because uh, you suppress the immunity of the mucosa of the pool and rectum. So what do you think about this? It's not uh, the same uh, philosophy, rectal and uh, uh, surgery or uh, colon uh, surgery. With uh, colon surgery, we don't prepare it with the level uh, one of uh, evidence. But in rectal surgery, as you see the, the, the publication, there is no uh, good evidence to, to not do a preparation. And uh, in the future, I, I, uh, as uh, I see in the publication that uh, a lavage 
of the rectal uh, is perhaps an alternative. And regarding, regarding the post-operative uh, period, uh, do you early feed the patient or do you wait until uh, they uh, are open bowel or pass motion or something like that? After gas, after uh, retablishment. After gas? Uh, okay. Do you have any other comments? Okay, so by this uh, nice presentation and talk, uh, we uh, reached the last uh, part of our uh, seminar. It was very useful, very uh, conclusive. Uh, and uh, I like also to thank uh, the company, the Easy Search company for uh, hosting us uh, and uh, for uh, this major contribution. Uh, and I hope uh, to uh, meet soon. And if we uh, have any uh, comments from you, Tarek. Okay, I think uh, we can uh, now conclude the session and uh, 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 no other comments. So thank you very much. And uh, we hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.